Now we're going to get into the finer details of the deep lift method, the nuts and bolts, if you will. I'm going to start by giving a high level overview of the deep lift philosophy and defining some terms. Next, we're going to discuss the rules for handling specific kinds of functions. And finally, we'll see how deep lift addresses the and situation discussed in the previous video. The philosophy behind deep lift is to explain the difference from some reference value of the output in terms of the difference from the reference value of the inputs. That is, formally, supposing you have a target neuron, T, that has a difference from reference of delta T. Consider some layer X, which can be the input layer, that has neurons X1 through Xn, where X1 through Xn are necessary and sufficient to compute T. Our goal with deep lift is to blame the difference from reference of t on the difference from reference of the inputs x1 through xn. When we do this, we will assign contributions c delta x delta t such that the sum over all the contributions is equal to the difference from the reference of t. Okay, so what is this reference value that we keep mentioning? For intermediate neurons in the network, the reference activation of the neuron is defined as the activation that the neuron has when the network is supplied a reference input. Okay, so now the problem becomes, what is a good reference input? The choice of a reference input depends on domain knowledge, but broadly speaking, one should ask oneself the question, what am I interested in measuring differences against? It's worth noting that one can study the results on multiple different references if there are many different things that you want to compare the values against. For MNIST, we use a reference of all zeros because that is the background of the images. For genomics, we explored two choices of reference. In the first case, we use a reference representing the frequencies of ACGT in the background, and in the second case, for each sequence, we generate multiple references by, shuff by shuffling the original sequence, and our final result is obtained by averaging the results, results over all the generated references. We now introduce the concept of multipliers, which will come in handy when we do our backpropagation. The multiplier for x to t is defined as the contribution of x to t divided by the difference from reference of x. Compare this to the definition of a partial derivative, which is the infinitesimal change in t caused by x divided by the infinitesimal change in x. Just like partial derivatives, multipliers satisfy a chain rule. That is, the multiplier of xi to z can be found by taking the product of the multipliers for xi to yj and yj to z and summing over all the interme inter intermediate neurons yj. For the same reason, that the gradients can be computed efficiently via backpropagation using the chain rule, multipliers can also be computed efficiently via the chain rule. In other words, given the multipliers for each input to its immediate outputs, you can use the chain rule to find the multipliers for any input to any output. We are going to encounter some situations where it will be helpful to treat positive and negative contributions differently. In order to do so, for every xi, we introduce delta xi plus and delta xi minus, which represent the positive and negative parts of delta xi. Splitting up delta xi in this way will allow us to compute different multipliers for delta xi plus and delta xi minus, if we so desire. However, this situation isn't going to come up for some time. In the first few situations I'll walk through, we will end up giving the same treatment to delta xi plus and delta xi minus, and I will start talk, <laughs> talk about them starting from the next slide. Okay, so now we're getting to the heart of the deep lift method. I mentioned previously that given the multipliers for each input to its immediate outputs, we can use the chain rule to compute the multipliers for any input to any output. So this is where we start defining the multipliers for each input to its immediate outputs. We start with the case of the simple linear function shown. For this function, we have delta y is equal to sum over all i, wi, delta xi. We are going to define the positive and negative parts of delta y in the most intuitive way you can think of. We are going to say that the positive part of delta y is just the sum of the positive terms, and the negative part of delta y is just the sum of the negative terms. Now recall that delta x is itself split up into delta x plus and delta x minus. So when we apply this splitting up, we get the formula shown. 
This, in turn, leads to a very natural definition of the contributions. Every time a particular term appears, we just take its coefficient along for the ride and say that that whole thing is the contribution of that term to either delta y plus or delta y minus, whatever we're looking at. Once we have defined the uh, contributions, we can then find the multipliers by dividing the contributions by the difference from reference, leading to the formula shown. Note that here we have ended up with the multipliers on delta x plus being the same as the multipliers on delta x minus. But as I mentioned earlier, we are going to see some situations where this won't always be the case. Note that I have quietly glossed over the case where delta x is zero. If delta x is zero, we could just set its multiplier to also be zero and maintain our property that the contributions of uh, over the input sum to the delta of the output. That was kind of the first property that we illustrated. However, if delta x is zero, it doesn't necessarily mean that delta x plus and delta x minus are zero. And if we were to set the multipliers to zero, we would never find out if anything interesting is happening with delta x plus and delta x minus. Thus, we strike a compromise and we say that if delta x is zero, then the we give half of the multiplier or half of the weight going to delta y plus and half going to delta y minus and we do the same for delta x minus. Okay, that's it for the linear function. Now what about nonlinearities? When I talk about nonlinearities, I'm referring to single input functions, i.e. y is equal to f of x. Examples of this are sigmoid functions, rectified linear units, hyperbolic tangents, you name it. We are going to present two choices for how to deal with nonlinearities. The first is something we call the rescale rule. This rule will end up giving the same treatment to positive and negative contributions, and we will once again find that the multiplier on the positive contributions is the same as the multiplier on the negative contributions. The rescale rule will allow us to tackle the saturation and thresholding failure modes that uh, was presented in previous slides, but it does not tackle the min slash and failure mode. The second rule that we'll present is called the reveal cancel rule. This rule does give a different treatment to positive and negative contributions, so we will find that the multiplier on the positive terms can differ from the multiplier on the negative terms. The reveal cancel rule addresses the saturation thresholding failure modes as well as the min slash and failure mode. But as we will find, this can also make it sensitive to noise, and there will be some situations where we would want to use the rescale rule on certain layers in our network, network instead of the reveal cancel rule, and, and we will see some of them soon. Okay, let's talk about the rescale rule. This rule sets delta y plus and delta y minus proportional to delta x plus and delta x minus. That is, it sets delta y plus equal to the ratio of delta y divided by delta x multiplied by delta x plus and similarly for delta y minus. We assume that all the contribution to delta y plus comes from delta x plus and all the contribution to delta y minus comes from delta x minus, which leads the multipliers to simply be the ratio of the change in the output divided by the change in the input, that is delta y divided by delta x, and as mentioned, you can see that the multipliers are the same for the positive and the negative terms. Let's take a quick detour here and walk through a specific example using the linear and rescale rule. Because the multipliers on the positive and negative contributions are always the same with those two rules, for simplicity we will not bother with the breakdown into delta x plus and delta x minus, but that will come up in a subsequent example. Let's look at this network, which is another example of the thresholding failure mode. H1 is the max of 0 and I1, and H2 is the max of 0 and I2 minus 1.5. When the input is I1 is equal to 1 and I2 is equal to 1, the values for H1 and H2 are 1 and 0 0.5 respectively, which in turn gives Y is equal to 3 with 2 coming from H1 and 1 coming from H2. First, let's look at what happens when you compute the gradients. We have 
dy by dh1 is equal to 2 and dy by dh2 is equal to 2, just based on the coefficient of h1 and h2. Because the gradient of h1 and h2 with respect to their inputs is just 1, because it's an actor rectified the new unit, by the chain rule we get dy by di1 is equal to 2 and dy by di2 is equal to 2. And when we do gradient times uh, delta input, where the delta is measured with respect to 0, we get a contribution of 2 from i1 and a contribution of 4 from i2. Now, 2 plus 4 is equal to 6, so where does the remaining negative 3 come from? Well, the answer is that it comes from the bias term negative 1.5. And that negative 1.5 is contributing negative 3 to the output in this method of assigning contributions. I argue that that's a bit misleading because if anything i2 should have a lower contribution than i1 precisely because of the suppression coming from that bias term. How does deep lift get around this problem? Let's find out. The first step with deep lift is to define your reference. So here let's just assume that the reference for i1 and i2 are both 0. We then forward propagate this reference giving a reference of 0 on h1 and h2 and 0 on y. Having defined the references, we now find the difference from reference of every neuron, which is just equal to the actual value of the neuron since the reference everywhere is zero. Now that we have the difference from reference, we are in position to find the multipliers. The multipliers of h1 and h2 with respect to y are both two just according to the coefficients. By the rescale rule, the multiplier of i1 with respect to h1 is delta h1 divided by delta i1, which is equal to one. And the multiplier of i2 with respect to h2 is delta h2 divided by delta i2, which is 1 over 4. Now, by the chain rule, we can find that the multiplier of i1 with respect to y is the multiplier of i1 with respect to h1 times the multiplier of h1 with respect to y. And the multiplier of i2 with respect to y similarly is the multiplier of i2 with respect to h2 times the multiplier of h2 with respect to y, which gives 0.5. And on the left, we, we have two. Uh, finally, to compute the contributions, we just take the multiplier of the input with respect to our target output and multiply by the difference from reference of the input. So on the left, this gives a contribution of two to i1. And on the right, this gives a contribution of one to i2, which matches the fact that y is equal to two from h1 plus one from h2.